I was watching Narnia for the plot, and I wondered, why are they all lined up in a field to fight? Why don't they come in from the sides, or sneak behind, go to their houses and steal one sock out of each pair, so they're forced to wear odd socks? Surely that's smarter than agreeing to meet in a line and charge straight on. So I did some research and found some cool things about war. What is First things first, and you gotta remember this, back in swordsman times, they didn't have iPhone. For armies to get information about other armies, they had to use the art of spying. One army would send spies to check out the other army, and it would take two days to find them, and another two days to come back. And by then, the info was rubbish. So uh, yes, General, the Roman army was right by the river two days ago. They had, I don't know, a thousand people? I wasn't taught how to count. Hey boss, the Celts are going to attack us in two days, so let's just leave, right? We can leave them a note. To actually get into a battle, armies would need to use the art of deception. This time, the Romans sat by the river again with only 500 people. The Celts came four days later ready to attack. But the Romans also had spies and knew there were 2,000 Celts. So the Romans had 5,000 troops hiding behind a tree ready to surprise them. But the Celts had prepared for this and they had 10,000 troops hiding in the river. But the Romans knew about that so they had 50,000 troops hiding underground. Always prepared, however, the Celts had 50 million eagles on their side. And eventually it got too convoluted convoluted so they just attacked each other. Most movies don't explain what happens before the fight, you just see bloodshed. Probably because that's more interesting and watching someone talk about before a battle would be boring. Oh sh- So armies only battled each other when both sides had information and thought that they had the advantage. Meaning that most human deaths in wars are solely Steve Jobs' fault. <laughs> So they met in fields because they thought they would win easily, but why were they in lines? Well, if you're one man, you can see your front easily, but your sides are weak. These are called your flanks. If someone attacks you from that side, you're at a disadvantage. But two people standing next to each other only have one flank each. And 100 people next to each other only have two flanks out of all of them. That's a 0 0.02 flank per person ratio. Just don't be the guy on the outside. Some really cool strategies were used in wars, like the famous Battle of Thermopylae, shown in the movie 300, led by But first, let's talk about this guy. Wait, where is he? Ah, down there. Napoleon had 115 principles of war. 115 strategies on how to win. Before you think that's impressive, number one was be at the battle first and bring more men. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. He was a sexist. He believed that only men deserve to die in war. Disgusting. He also cared about economy of force. That means that if Napoleon played a video game, he would use every item and all of his mana in each fight. I like to imagine a Death Note adaptation of war generals planning attacks. I'll take a baguette and eat it. They say we must fight to keep our freedom. You see, there was this famous guy called Genghis Khan, like the ancient Beyonce of the 13th century. He put fear into the hearts of all around him, just like Beyonce. Let me put you in the shoes of someone who was fighting against the Mongolians in the 1200s. You're in a Chinese army of 10,000 men. They were sexist too, they only allowed men to die in war. You're marching, and 50 Mongolian horsemen ride at you, firing arrows. They make almost no noise, just a couple of arrows flying. 50 versus 10,000. So your army charges at the horsemen, and then then as you're about to catch them, drums start blaring all around you. Then a death cry from thousands roar from behind the hill in front of you. Thousands of Mongolians ride down onto you. You start questioning if Buddhism is the right religion and start praying to anything you can think of. This tactic terrified the Chinese troops so much that their lines crumbled and they couldn't fight properly. Even if the Mongolians were outnumbered, they could still win with this strategy and by being generally scary. Top 5 reasons the Mongolians were badass. To surprise their enemies, they would attack when least expected like during full blizzards. Most of them didn't wear armor because it was too heavy for them to do 360 no-scopes on their horses. They put fake dummies on horses and charged them into battle to make their army seem larger. When sieging castles, they dropped leaflets from kites that said, if you tell us the secret entrance, we'll give you money, a horse, and a massage. And they weren't sexist. They let women die in war. Hooray! A hundred Mongols was called a Jagoon. Wait. I'm renaming my YouTube channel to 100 Mongols. But just because the Mongolians slaughtered 40 million people doesn't mean they were rude. If an army surrendered to them, they would happily take them into their own tribe. They welcomed all immigrants, as long as they were doctors or had rich parents. Moving on to the movie 300 and King. 300 Spartans. Just kidding. They say we must fight. 
We're still on the Mongols. They're cool, okay? You know when a YouTuber starts Twitch streaming and they're good at it? Like, no, you can't be adaptable to other things. You have one job. Well, the Mongols were like that. Mongolia learned new things like how to build boats, use catapults, and adapt to the hot tub meta. Then Genghis Khan died and they all gave up. Mongolia still to this day has more horses than people. There's got to be a better way! 300 Spartans, led by that one guy. Who is he? The Persians wanted to invade the Greeks, because the Greeks had all the protein powder in the world. But between Persia and Greece, there was only one small passage. So took 7,000 men to protect it, and 300 of those 7,000 were Spartans. Sparta was just one city in Greece. After two days of fighting off the 150,000 Persians with their superior lines and abs, the Persians saw bouldering on their Instagram. They went around the mountain and snuck up behind them, where the famous 300 Spartans fought, and there died... <laughs> The Germans of a particular political party were in Russia, near the village of Kurikino. They were lost and asked an 83-year-old farmer for directions into the Russian Defense Force. Matvey Kuzmin agreed to help them if they paid him in flour. Yeah, he said he'd betray his country for some flour. Must have made some nice pancakes. He led them for six kilometers into the night. Then, out of nowhere, it was... <laughs> Now nah, it was the Russians. Kuzmin had sent his grandson forward to set up an ambush. Everyone died at the end. You tell me. That's how every story in history ends, actually. Everyone died at the end. They say we must fight. We're back, never done with the Mongols. So if war was so deadly, why did people agree to fight? Well, Genghis Khan was a sweetheart. He let his army take the loot that they got. It was an egalitarian society. Whatever the loot was, it was shared between your Jagoon. And as Genghis was rewarding, he was also punishing. If a unit disobeyed orders, a soldier could expect nothing less than the death penalty. And then there's a hyperlink in case I don't know what death is. Absolutely nothing. Nukes. We have replaced war with the threat of instant death. If you want people to use cool military strategies, you can't do that in real life. Which is why we have video games. Watch the other Dragoon. <laughs>